So hear now this passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Hear of Jesus' triumphant entry. As Jesus came to Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave two disciples a task. He said, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. Those who had been sent found it exactly as he said. And as they were untying the colt, the owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clothes over the, on the colt, and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, they spread their clothes on the road. As Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, a whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because all the mighty things that they had seen. They said, Blessing on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the hev- highest heavens. So some of the Pharisees from the crowd t- said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. Jesus answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, may these spoken words be faithfully to the written word and lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, so here we go. Getting into the nitty gritty now. Holy Week is upon us, and there is no turning back now. We're just one week away from celebrating Easter. One week away from being able to eat chocolate again, or drink a cup of coffee, or whatever it is that you gave up for the season. One week to go when you can stop doing whatever spiritual discipline you decided to do. Although you could continue it, it's perfectly fine beyond Lent. But the end, the end of this journey is coming. Now, if you truly want to experience Easter in a whole new way, then I invite you to participate in the special services that we're doing. This is my yearly plea. If you leave today waving palms and maybe getting ready for messy church and the Easter egg hunt later on today at 3 o'clock, and don't come back for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, you'll think all we do is party. Easter will be a full and a time of rejoicing but the meaning can be potentially lost. And maybe lost because there's a lot that happens in Jesus' life during this last week. On Thursday, he gathers his disciples to give them the sacrament of communion, which we will do on Thursday at 7 o'clock. On Friday, we will walk through the Gospel of John with some special music written by our very own Dustin Shelton and performed by our very own choir. We'll walk hand in hand with Jesus as he is arrested tried, beaten, crucified, and dies. Then we'll gather at dawn out in the field at the cross and profess that the tomb is empty and afterwards enjoy a potluck breakfast together in the fellowship hall on Easter morning. At 10 o'clock, we'll gather back here in the dark of a sanctuary and celebrate and welcome the risen Lord. Now, if you want a moving spiritually connected Holy Week, then please come and attend these special services. I promise your heart will be full at the table on Thursday, and it will ache at the cross and cry at the tomb, and then it will be ready to be in the awe of God's power and glory on Easter morning. But today, today we're just starting that final leg of the Lenten journey. And we start off by looking at Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now, this is a story that's in each four of the Gospels. Usually, if all four of them have a similar story, that really means that we need to pay attention to it because that is a popular one that was told by Jesus' disciples in the years to come. It was so important that it lasted for almost 70 years until finally John, the last Gospel written, put pen to parchment. This year, in the lectionary, which is a cycle of three years, we hear Luke's story. And there are a few things that are unique to the Gospel of Luke. They give us an interesting 
they give us an interesting look on why Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. The first unique thing is that in Luke's story, there's no palms mentioned at all. The crowd lays down its garments, its co- their coats, their clothes. Nowhere in Luke's version of this story are there mentioned of palms. In Matthew and Mark, they mention cut branches from trees, but not palms either. Specifically, John's gospel is where we get the Palm Sunday from. It comes from John 12, 13, which says they took palm branches and went out to meet him. This is where we get the idea of Palm Sunday, but not in Luke's gospel. There is also no Hosanna sung in Luke's gospel. The people say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, that phrase is important, and we'll come back to it. But notice, there isn't one Hosanna. Now, Matthew, Mark, and John's gospel, they all have the crowd shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That line, minus the Hosanna, is a direct quote from the psalm that Kara read. Psalm 118, verse 26. But in the psalm, there isn't a Hosanna either. Hosanna, translated from the Greek, means, please save us, or save us, Lord. So why are these things, which we deeply associate to this Sunday, singing Hosanna, the palm branches of waving, why is it not found in Luke's gospel? Luke's goal for writing is to show that that when Jesus is entering Jerusalem, it stands in stark contrast to another person who may have been entering the same city on the same day. So put a mental finger in that thought, and we're going to get back to it. But in Luke 19.38, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now all the other gospels, they say, Blessed is he, not blessed is the king. Luke is making a deep comparison to Jesus' triumphant entry. Palms and shouts of save us, Lord, they were very nationalistic symbols. And according to Fred Craddock, who is a biblical scholar, Luke omits them because the goal in his writing this story was to show that Jesus is the king we needed, not necessarily the king we wanted. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, the center of religious power of the Jewish faith and the center of political power for the Roman government that is there. The king that was coming would stand in huge contrast to both of these power structures. In contrast, Luke is trying to make, uh, is against Pontius Pilate. There's two historians, John Dominic Crozen and and Marcus Borg, who wrote a book called Last Week, which is about this week, Holy Week, the last week of Jesus' life. They state that as Jesus is finishing his pilgrimage and entering the holy city on the west side of the city, Pilate is making his grand entrance on the east side of the city. And so if you look at the map here, you can see what I'm talking about. On the left, you can see the east side of Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate, he visits Jerusalem. He's probably coming because Passover is coming and he wants to make sure there's no rebellion or anything. So all the power of Rome is coming to the city during this holiday season. But he probably stays uh, what is called a a sea resort, the Caesarea by the Sea. It's a five-star, luxurious, all-inclusive resort. And who who wouldn't choose to rather stay on the Mediterranean coast? So he's coming from the east or from the west. Pilate's entry would have been with lots of guards and with lots of pageantry. Romans, they wanted to make a big to-do about them coming into a city that they were occupying. They wanted to make sure and make it clear who was in charge, who had the power, and who was behind them. Pilate would have probably been riding a war horse with tons of guards and demanding that the people of Jerusalem honor his arrival as a sign of Roman Roman strength and that he is going to be keeping this city safe and in line during this holiday season. Luke wants to make sure that without a doubt that the parade happening on the other side of town doesn't look like this. Now, if we go back to the map, you can see that as Jesus is coming in, uh, he comes from the other side of the town, the east. The beginning of the, the chapter 19, Jesus starts off in Jericho. 
And we pick up this final leg of the journey as he comes down through the Mount Olive and Bethpage and Bethany. There says there is a throng of people who welcome Jesus into the city. They lay down pieces of clothes to welcome this king into Jerusalem. They quote scripture and are ready for him to be the savior that they're hoping for. But I wonder if people at Jesus' parade thought he was going to be like Pilate, who was entering the other side of the city. Now, we don't get a hint at that. We're kind of looking into that a little bit, uh, you know, reading that into the scripture. But the destination of these two parades tell us a lot about the motivation of those who are leading it. Pilate is heading to the kingdom or to the palace. But as you can see for Jesus, he is going to the temple on the east side of Jerusalem. This is where Jesus goes. Other gospels, they have him stop at the temple and then go back uh, for the night. But in Luke, the passage just flows right into the temple. After he quotes and says that the stones will cry out, Jesus weeps over the city and then predicts the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans who are on the other side of the city. Then he enters the temple, he cleanses it by kicking out those who are selling things, and he starts to teach in it that night and then later on uh, during the week. As he does in verse 30, uh, 47 and 48, which is st- still in chapter 19 of Luke, it says, Jesus was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests, the legal experts, and the foremost leaders among them were seeking to kill him. However, they couldn't find a way to do it because all the people were enthralled with what they heard. As Jesus enters the city and starts teaching at the temple, the people there are just captivated by him. They love his teachings and his style. He is, he is winning the people over and is making it, the religious leaders very upset. And Jesus tends to do this a lot. We see this as he enters the city and while he is teaching. Jesus is stirring the pot too much according to those who are in charge of the religious power in the great city. They understood what happened when people poked the bear of the Roman occupying forces. They've seen rebellions put down and put down very violently, and they do not want to see that again. Remember, Jesus is at the center of two great powers, the religious power because of the temple, and then the other side of the city, the ruling power of Herod and Rome, where Pilate is. It is here, at the center of the power structure of this part of the world, that Jesus attempts to flip everything on its head in order to do what is needed to save humanity. But because Jesus knows this, doesn't mean everyone else is on board. We can tell in reading Luke that he had a plan. He knew what he was doing. You can tell this because of the whole cult thing in the beginning of this, uh, this story. Scholars don't believe that this was some kind of like divine prophetic moment of Jesus. It wasn't like he had a vision that there was a cult tied up, that he actually, there was some kind of like magical thing saying, oh, this is the cult that you are looking for. No. Jesus more likely had this planned out, knew where the cult would be, and then sent his disciples there to tell the owner that the master now needs it. But the symbolism of this cult that has never been written is, is unique. It's unique because Jesus said, you'll find, a, you'll find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden. Now, I'm not a big horse rider. I've ridden a few, but those have been trail horses used to strangers sitting on them. But there's, this is a colt that has never been ridden and has never felt the weight of a human being on its back. I don't have to be a, a cowboy or a horse trainer to know that this could probably go horribly wrong. Not only that, but then where is this unridden cult taken? To the temple, to the, through the city, in the midst of a holiday crowd, a throng of people who are celebrating and throwing their clothes on the ground, a whole crowd surrounding them. All I know about horses tells me that I would pre- prefer to be on the horse that Pilate rode in on, not Jesus. I would want to be on the one who knows what it feels like to carry a human being what a crowd of people feels like, and what to do around loud noises. This unridden cult has too much potential to be spooked, to hurt Jesus or any of the other people in the crowd. It seems like a very sketchy plan to me. But this is what Jesus has planned. 
The cult symbolizes something new is coming into the holy city. A new way of doing things. Luke is making it clear that this is a stark difference between the one in charge of this area, the one in power, Pontius Pilate, and the king who is coming in the name of the Lord. There are no palms or shouts of Hosanna because these were nationalistic symbols. They were used to welcome military leaders and other powerful people. Luke is making sure that those things are not included in Jesus' arrival. There is a cult that is unridden and not a trained war horse. There is a difference in this king coming to the holy city. A non-violent one who is concentrating and focusing on changing the world through sacrifice, forgiveness, love, and grace. New things can scare old paradigms and power structures. When we look at our own country's history, we can see this in many places. There was a march planned in Alabama in 1965 to march from Selma to the capital city of Montgomery, about 54 miles. They marched to ensure that African Americans would exercise their constitutional right to vote, which wasn't allowed in the segregated systems and the power structure of Alabama. The governor there called this march illegal, and so state troopers were on the other side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma to stop the protest march. This is a nonviolent march, and news cameras captured the scene as the state troopers attacked the marchers, leaving many of them injured, bloody, and some of them unconscious. They tried again two days later, but turned around at the bridge, obeying the court order, preventing them to march. The world saw how the protesters were treated. And, the Pre- and President Johnson then sent 1,000 military policemen and 2,000 army troops to make sure they could make the journey this time without any issues. And 25,000 people made the final leg of the 54-mile march to Montgomery. In a nonviolent manner, these marchers helped transform our nation. But it did come at a cost. Reverend James Reeb, a white minister, was murdered on March 7th of that, that week. Viola uh, Lazio was a white civil rights activist and was murdered driving marchers back from, to Selma on March 25th. And then later on, not in Alabama, but on April 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. But all this did lead to change, though. Later that year, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, which eliminated legal barriers at the state and local level to to prevent African Americans from voting. Now those in charge, the Pharisees, They could see the political tension coming to the center of both religious and political power. And this is why on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, they asked Jesus to tell their disciples, hey, y'all quiet down. They didn't want too much attention coming their way. They didn't want to rock the boat because then Rome would come down hard on them. But Jesus replies, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. There's no stopping this movement, this entry, this new way. You cannot silence the change that is coming into the holy city. You cannot silence the peace on the back of the unridden colt. You cannot silence God's truth coming to the place of God's presence, the temple. You cannot silence the right thing from being done. You cannot silence God's movement and march towards salvation for the world. Even if we humans tried to get in the way, to silence the march towards the temple, Jesus says creation would take over and announce the arrival of the new king. Not one of nationalistic tones of Hosanna or with palms waving. Make no mistake, in Luke's gospel, the king arriving to the seat of power is unlike any other the world has ever seen. As we start this last leg of our Lenten journey, may we be witnesses to the change that is coming, to the seed of power, this week and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are in awe of who you are. 
And so let us look beyond the power structures of our world to see the power that you bring with us. You bring to us the power of forgiveness, of grace, of love. You bring a different kind of power to this world that turns it on its head. And as followers of you, may we do the same. May we be so full of your grace that it overflows and on to the people that are in our lives. May we find this week, this holy week, something that transforms us into deeper followers of you. For it is in your name we pray. Amen.